Thanks very much, David. Okay, I'm going to be speaking for about 50 minutes or so, uh, following from a lot of things that Rob said, and then we're going to do a practical exercise at the end. Um, so, um, one of the things that, which is always a challenge in the role that we have is thinking about what is urban design, and, and people have thought about this um, in a number of different ways. Um, some of these are the kind of definitions which people have come up with. Um, and one of the most interesting things about this is that some of those definitions, the ones in white, are about the content, the product, the end product of the built environment. So it could be the space between buildings or uh, the relationships. The things in red are actually about the process we get there. So my talk's going to be talking both about the content, the product, um, what we call urban form, and also the process of getting there, some of the toolkits that um, all of us here, as, as people who influence the urban design realm, um, need to be using and need to be aware of. So when we're discussing urban form, um, urban form is the word we use to describe the built environment in its holistic sense. Um, and it's the physical expressions of the qualities that Rob talked about earlier on. And we'll talk about the relationship in a, in a minute. Um, what we've done, and I'm afraid there is going to be a bit of jargon in this talk, but I, I think it's important that we try and understand some of these concepts because they, they can be quite useful. Um, in terms of the way the form works, we, we've, and, and by design, also talked about these different, um, this, this hierarchy of form, starting off with the urban structure, which is the kind of biggest um, expression of, of built form, right down to the more detailed stuff. Um, this also, um, in a way, describes how different elements of the urban form persist through time, with the urban structure persisting the longest and streetscape and landscape changing much more frequently. All these things need to be addressed as part of what we call urban design. This is a, a matrix which we came up with which didn't actually go into by design. Um, but it, it's a very useful way, a very useful tool for describing how the um, qualities which Rob talked about, character distinctiveness, um, continuity, enclosure, including integration and efficiency, for example, relate to those different aspects of urban form I'm about to talk about here. Um, and what it does is it means that you can, when you talk about character, you don't just talk about something being in character. You can think about some places, it's the urban structure, which is which has a strong character. For example, the old the, the Barcelona grid, that gives this place a sense of structure, a uh, sort of sense of character. In other places, it might be the details of materials. We looked at Poundbury earlier on. So the idea of this matrix is that we're trying to um, relate those qualities with different aspects of urban form. And hopefully this will come clear um, over the, the course of this talk. So first of all, talking about urban structure, um, we define this in a way, I think, the, the, one of the best definitions of urban structure is, is the drawing you can do of a place with ten strokes of a pen. It's the kind of highest level, most simple um, way of describing a place. Um, it can relate to the landform, it can relate to um, the key routes, the spaces, um, through, through the area. It's also the part which persists the longest. This is a historic map, um, Hyde Park on the northern edge. Uh, you've got Kensington Road um, running along the top here, um, and Exhibition Road running north-south, and Queensquay running there. This is actually the area that was acquired um, as part of the Great Exhibition of 1851. Um, if you overlay this onto um, an aerial photograph of what the area looks like today, what we see is that those key routes actually persist for a long time, even though the buildings might change, the spaces might change over time. So if you drew a picture of that urban, urban structure, you'd have the key routes and, and the space at the top, perhaps. So they tend to consist of the main, main transport routes, movement routes through an area. Um, and when you look at a plan, um, you should be able to see what the urban structure is quite immediately. In this case, it might be um, that diagonal there, the, the, edge, the edge of the water here, and perhaps that, that space that's been put in there. That, that would be how you draw the urban structure. I want to give you an example of, of a project we're working on at the moment. Um, it happens to be in Newcastle, but 
in, in, in some senses that's irrelevant, uh, and describe how we built up an urban structure, um, just as, as an example. The study area itself um, is an area of West Newcastle, which has experienced significant decline in the last 30 years, so an area of low housing demand. Um, it's about three and a half kilometers from city center. Um, it's on the north bank of the Tyne, um, on, a, on a steep slope, um, south facing. So when we looked at this place, um, there's an aerial photograph of the area. It's been cleared of housing, um, and we're, we're looking at how we recreate a place in this area. I'm just going to describe you the story of how we built up an urban structure for this area. Just for interest, that's actually a large uh, factory making tanks for BAE systems. There's some challenging area points to the site. So we were given a brief for a certain number of units, a certain um, a series of different facilities, not just housing, it's neighborhood facilities, um, and it happens to be uh, an expo which we're promoting for 2010 of this area. Um, so we're given the site. What we identified, first of all, in terms of urban structure, is the key infrastructure running through the site, which is these key routes, plus the green, these green links that run through the area, um, plus the river, of course. Um, and then there are a series of local centers and civic clusters, um, which were joined by a key route. There was also happened to be proposals for a new academy and an improved city park. Um, and we proposed an, a, a, the strengthening of existing link through the area, and therefore where those two links met, met would be a, an improved neighborhood heart for the area. So I just, um, and that might create some sort of high street. Um, we also needed an arrival point for this expo, this big exhibition we're talking about, which will be on the main structuring route, uh, which has got lots of bus stops on it, but it happens to have, obviously, uh, it's a dual carriageway at the moment, but we need to think about how that might change over time. Um, and there'll be a link between the two nodes, and that link might look like that. Um, so, and the, and the key point here is also to link into the existing surroundings. So, through analyzing the site, the proposals, the existing areas have built up, this is what I call an urban structure diagram. Um, and so this is the kind of things that you should be seeing in urban design or, or master planning work that you're commissioning or involved in. The second form is the next stage down. This is what we call urban grain. Um, Frequently, urban designers talk about fine grain and coarse grain. Um, grain can refer both to the size of the blocks. So in this case here, we've got relatively small blocks. Um, it can also refer to the, 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 the plot width, the, the how wide the building is on, in that block as well. Um, and we're going to talk about how different areas um, and uh, different kinds of grain are successful in different ways. This is an example um, of Hume um, in, in Manchester. Um, in 1951, uh, this was a er large area of workers' housing, uh, which had been condemned um, for, for demolition. Um, what you notice is um, it's very, very fine grain. All the, all the blocks are very, very small uh, and very, very permeable in a sense. Um, what happened then was um, in the redevelopment um, in the late 60s, uh, was that they redeveloped it into essentially a, a large housing estate with some of these very large crescents, uh, which are, in our terminology we'd call coarse grain because they're a single building, which you can't demolish a bit of it. You have to keep the whole thing or demolish the whole thing. Um, and for, for lots of different reasons, this area is very unsuccessful, partly and, and significantly because of the way it was designed and because of the urban grain in the area. Um, it was then redeveloped in the 1990s, um, along a much more traditional uh, urban grain. Some of these routes are actually some of the historic routes which existed before the redevelopment in the 1960s. And, and uh, we as a company and many other companies are involved in a lot of, I think someone mentioned earlier on, some of the, the demolition work that's going on. You know, we involve a lot of these kind of schemes where we're reintroducing a, a fine grain since development. So why is it that fine grain is, has a positive thing? Why do we talk about it as urban designers? Well, um, fine grain, this is an area uh, just near Hyde Park again. Um, what it gives you, it gives you the ability to adapt over time. Rob talked about adaptability. You can take out a block or you can take out even a building 
and replace it with something else as needs change as, as time moves forward. Um, it allows you permeability so you can move around more easily um, as a pedestrian or, or even in a vehicle or on, on a bicycle. Um, so th there are a number of good reasons why fine grain is a good thing. Fine grain is developed naturally over time due to the ownership, land ownership issues. This is uh, Dublin, um, developed due to sort of development of burgage plots over time. We'll talk about them a bit more if people are interested. Um, but there are examples in the modern world where we've created fine grain development. This is Seaside in Florida where they had a, a very strong design code and one of the elements of the design code was to ensure that there was a fine grain of development so that if one of those buildings needed to change, it could do. Um, and create sort of more traditional streetscape with more vitality on the street, more entrances, etc. I'll flick through that one quickly. Um, some of the masters of fine grain development have been the Dutch in the, some of the more recent housing schemes, and we'll talk about that a bit more in a bit more detail if people are interested. Uh, this is another example of uh, in Dublin of, of making the modern street uh, where different architects are developing different uh, solutions within an overall um, envelope of, of design there. So in our example, how did we think about urban grain? Um, looking at the overall structure we talked about before, you've got an existing area of terraced housing in this, in, in this location here, which we need to knit in. There's no point creating a kind of pod of development that Rob mentioned earlier on. So we want to relate to that terraced sort of housing. Um, and extend them across the site. Um, but we also realised that the north-south routes need to be um, complemented by east-west routes because this is a very steep site and you need to want to move across as well up, as up and down the hill. Um, and so the terraces develop. We also then developed a series of routes which relate to um, Armstrong Road here, in this particular case, um, and that developed into a series of proposals for for, for the development. And from the urban structure then, you can develop a block structure which has got a certain grain to it, which relates to the context uh, and, and also relates to the routes and spaces that, that they've created. So that's, that's the resulting block structure. Okay, I'll just click through these. Okay, um, the next aspect of form we need to think about, we talked about urban structure, urban grain, is the density and mix and um, use the same graphic there. But it, the reason why these two are, are, are pitched together is because the density of development does relate to how the mix works as well. I and mean, we're all uh, well versed, I think, in the argument that um, you need a certain density of population to make certain services viable. Um, so transport services, uh, shopping, community services, etc. So there is obviously a strong relationship between the two. Um, but density isn't just about height. Um, this uh, is, a, is a famous graphic from um, the Urban Task Force report, uh, which shows three ways of developing um, a, a block out all the same density, 75 dph. People get very hung up about density must mean height, but that actually you can develop, in this case, a lot of open space and a lot of front and back doors and back gardens without compromising um, the fact that you have a reasonably high density as well. Um, density must relate to public transport and to the key routes and accessibility. Um, I think we're all, we're all signed up to that. Um, mix of uses must apply both horizontally along a street uh, and vertically within a building as well uh, and within a block as well. So you have a mix of uses in different aspects. It's not just about... A lot of developers talk about mixed use when they've got one little element of another use and the whole rest of it's residential. I think we need to be a bit more creative about how we mix uses. Car parking, how we, um, uh, retail, uh, community uses. These can all be self-reinforcing um, to make town centres and other places more successful. Height, height and massing is another key aspect that we need to talk about. Um, this is about the relative height between different buildings, uh, how they relate to each other. 
but also how the human scale relates to uh, the height of the building. Someone talked about human scale of cities earlier on. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a, key, a key concept that we have to uh, ensure that we, that we address. Um, obviously, the height and massing affects how uh, we see the skylines, how we see the place as a whole, and how, how legible we find it, as Rob talked about earlier on. Just a, a brief thing, I mean, probably most people are aware, but there are, there's a difference between the actual builder shouldering height, which is the visible height from the street, uh, and how the, uh, the sunlight impacts within the public space and the actual height of the building itself. And often it's possible to introduce setback stories um, into development without actually compromising the amount of sunlight you get in public space, for example. So there's some subtleties there that we need to take on board. I think we need to get beyond, as urban designers, to get beyond just talking about residential, just talking about retail, because uh, there's a massive difference between a a Tesco Extra and a fine grain local store. There's a big difference between a housing villa and an apartment. So I think urban form, we need to start just considering a bit more complexity, uh, what we mean. Um, this is an example, an historic example in, in, in France um, of how different housing types can be in, included within a plot. So you've got your main house on the main street, um, then leads into sort of a mews at the back with small development here, and then back onto the main street again. So. We might call that residential, but that's a bit more than just a residential use. And I think we should try to um, be a bit more, as I say, a bit, bit, bit more subtle about it. Rob talked about how the public and the private interface work. This is perhaps one of the most important aspects of, of urban design, and we spend a lot of time thinking about this. Um, in this case, you've got the private realm, the housing, the front doors. You've then got an, an interface, which is behind these gateways, which is kind of a, a transitional zone, and then you've got the public realm of the pavement here. Um, and how those factors uh, relate to each other is really, really important. A lot of the time we have confusion around that definition of space, and that leads to a lot of problems and antisocial behavior and, and problems with uh, overlooking, etc. cetera. Um, here's an example of, of historic and modern development. And what they've done here is they've set the building back and slightly up to give both a, a sense of privacy of people living in and working in these, in these properties, but also there's a good relationship between the facade here and the public realm so that people who are walking on the street feel that they're well overlooked um, by people who might be working and living in, in, in the property. So that relationship's very important. There's a lot of windows here, so that's also potentially a positive thing. Um, details and materials, obviously very important as well. Um, and that can give a real sense of character to a place over time. Um, these are two examples of how a, a unified approach to materials. Uh, this is uh, Shad Thames um, in, on the South Bank near uh, GLA. And this is Poundbury again. How they use palettes of materials to cre create a sense of identity and character for a place. Um, streetscape and landscape is very important. Um, a lot of cities have used the redevelopment of public realm, not least London, with its 100 uh, spaces program to, uh, as a marketing tool um, for, um, and to create kind of a better image for the city. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you are involved in this on a daily basis. Um, obviously, a range of different spaces. Um, one of the most interesting things is how we create lingering in places. And there's a very famous study from the 1960s which basically says that you need to find places for people to sit as one of the key aspects of making a successful public realm. That may be formal or informal. Um, so just looking at our example again, what we did is we looked at the public realm, we looked at the topography, um, looked at how we might integrate the water within the scheme um, and came up with an overall structure which incorporates um, the green routes, the blue routes through the area. Fortunately, it hasn't come up hugely well on the screen there. Uh, and came up with that's the kind of uh, massing of development we looked at for this particular scheme. So I've talked about the product, the aspects of urban form. Now I'm going to talk about the process, how we get there. Um, and this is necessarily going to be an overview because there's lots of different things to consider here. And I think seminar three is going to consider some of these things in a lot more detail. So what have we got in our toolbox that we can, we can choose? Um, there's a huge range of different words that are used for different kinds of urban design guidance. Um, and I'm going to talk about a few of those today. 
uh, and maybe we can discuss them later on. Um, there isn't necessarily a, a one place where you can define all these things. What we found um, in, in by design when, when Rob, Rob and our initiatives were, were writing this, that we tried to not use the word master plan because it's, it can be construed in many different ways. I mean, uh, there is no clear definition of it. Um, but what we did find is that when the uh, Urban Task Force came out with their report, um, they used master plans throughout. So um, it's now ubiquitous um, in the industry. Um, Clearly the role of the master planner or urban designer um, is a complicated one. Um, and in some ways, um, what it really is about is about joining up and understanding all these different specialisms and bringing them together um, in, a, in a way which um, overcomes some of the problems we have. You know, a lot of urban places are very complicated. There's a lot of different interests. People talked about you know, developers want to maximize their profits or um, uh, pro professionals, we, we want to, we have our own interests, as do the public. In a way, uh, uh, the, the master panel is really trying to mediate between those different interests uh, in, in a way and, and try and create a good place. You know, we often talk about our client being the place, not necessarily being the person who's paying our, uh, our commission. It's, we, we want to make sure that the overall place works. We talked about all those different as, uh, types of urban design guidance, and um, if we could summarize wi what are the things they all have to have, um, they all need to be related to the context. Too, much, too many proposals come forward without a good relationship with context. Obviously, we need to relate to policy at different levels, um, and, and finally, and a big bugbear of mine is we need to make it feasible. Um, too many master plans or urban design frameworks or whatever you want to call them are sitting on shelves gathering dust because they're, frankly um, they, they're never really been carefully considered. And obviously and most critically the aspect of creativity here. This happens too many times. So um, Rob actually uh, and the Urban Design Group have come up with a document which you may want to look at in a bit more detail, um, and it tries to define um, some of these terms and goes into a bit more detail as to some of the things we've been talking about today in terms of what you, the kind of things that you might want to um, might want to look at when you're when you're asking someone or yourself creating an urban design framework or development brief. The urban design frameworks that we um, we looked at here are kind of uh, they're, they're broad brush. Uh, they're looking at a, 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 quite a wide area um, uh, and coming up with specific proposals. Development briefs are for specific sites um, and obviously looking at proposals for those. Um, design guides can cover particular topics like shop fronts or they can cover particular character areas, say um, Covent Garden or a particular area in, in, in a town. Uh, and master plans can be included in all those different aspects. But there's quite good definitions in this document. One of the things I want to talk about um, is uh, many of you may be clients uh, at some stage, and it's really important that um, when you define what you want as a master plan that we get beyond uh, that that's m very much clarified because as um, consultants sometimes what a, what a client wants, which might be something like that, what the consultant wants might be something like that, um, and there might be a problem. So. You need to make sure that it's all well defined at the beginning. Um, I want to talk about briefly about design codes. Design codes are kind of very much flavour of the month in terms of urban design terms, but they've been going for 2,000 years. The Romans used them, the Georgians used them throughout London uh, to create their, their area, and they've, but the recent resurgence has come out of the US with the new urbanist movement, um, and since 2004 the UK government have been are presenting them as a way of improving the quality of design of, of, of especially uh, new places. Um, this is the transect, the urban transect used by the new urbanists, which talks about how the development in the centre of the city should be different from the development at the edge of the city and how that might change between those two areas. It's quite a simplistic model, does have some applications. Um, Poundbury was developed using a design code. 
Um, this obviously focused on all sorts of things, including the highway design, but the materials um, and the way that buildings related to the street were all covered uh, within that urban design code. Um, they don't have to be as prescriptive as this. Um, they can also be a lot more flexible. Um, this is uh, an Aaron Harlow, which is also design coded. Interestingly here, the colors were actually part of a palette which you could choose from as an architect. This is one of my favorite examples of design code. This is uh, Borneo Sporenberg in, in Amsterdam. And it's very, very simple. It just talks about urban grain, talks about the relative, uh, how the floors work, um, and how different heights work along the street. Uh, and these very, very few rules actually resulted in a uh, development which was um, incredibly varied. And although I might not like all the architecture there, um, at least um, it shows that design codes don't have to come up with a poundbury. You can actually create a lot of variety. But within a fixed building line here, uh, with a, a fixed, more or less fixed building height and um, plot width. Design statements. Um, my view on design statements, this is a, a, new, a new requirement for all planning applications uh, that aren't household planning applications. My, my view on them is that they shouldn't create any more work because we should already be doing, as if we're good designers, we should be doing this work anyway. So um, it shouldn't be an additional work. Um, design panels, um, again, can be very useful. They can provide an objective perspective. I understand that a lot of uh, um, the, the, the boroughs are now promoting design panels within their area. Um, they won't necessarily get you good design. It depends on the people on the panel and how they're managed, obviously. Um, but they can provide a lot, quite a lot of value. Design, obviously, is a factor when considering planning applications. Um, and it's really important that we recognize through PPS 1 and the other planning policy statements that are coming out, such as PPS 3, that design is a factor which we can refuse a planning application on. Um, I think CABE looked at the 5,500 applications that were put in at the end of 2004, second half of 2004, and found that um, of those on design grounds, 35% only 35% were acceptable. So design really is a, is, is a means for refusing an application. And, and the example that one of the, the gentlemen there gave um, of, of a, a housing development, we should be refusing that if we don't think the design is good enough. And we can use some of those design tools to be proactive uh, as local authorities. Design champions, um, that's gonna, we're going to talk about that in seminar three in detail. Um, any presentation on, on the urban design process can't be complete without including an aspect on how we look at community issues. Um, involving the community shouldn't just be what we get the office junior to do. Um, it is obviously a fundamental um, part of developing a good urban design, um, it's a place that's been brought into by the people who live there. Um, they are the experts, after all, of the place. Um, we often have difficulties defining who is the community. It's a huge range of people. There is no such thing as the community. Um, and obviously, it's not a box ticking exercise. Um, what we often find with, with uh, the, the community involvement is that we need to go through a capacity building. As much as like we're kind of talking to you now about urban design, we go through the same kind of process with the local community to get them up to speed, to make them understand. I'm going to talk about a, a method that we've used elsewhere in terms of um, site visits as well. Um, this is a method which has been developed over time. It's a very simple but very effective method for um, both training people up, but also um, make, helping them to understand a place and look at it through different eyes. Often, when you ask people what they want, they talk about parochial things like the bins or uh, parking issues. Or uh, we need to uh, get people to look at the wider area, the wider concept of the place as well. So, place check asks three major questions: What do you like about this place? What do you dislike about it? and what needs to be improved. What it then does is it breaks those three questions down into a set, a set of um, checklists. So uh, here's some examples. And 
you may be, well be using this as a method in your seminar two, which is the next seminar when you go on a site visit, as a, a means of structuring how you think about the place and how you analyse it and what could be improved, obviously. So here's some examples of, of how it worked before. A second method for analysing a place, and it's something else that we're going to be using again on your, some of your site visits next next time. So um, you, you you may well uh, need to, to look at this in some detail. Um, is something called Building for Life, uh, which is a, actually an award that that's given out for housing developments in particular uh, in the UK. Um, what it's trying to get away from is the kind of uh, development that we see there. Um, it asks um, 20 questions in four areas. Um, looking at character, some of these are the kind of overlap with the kind of things that Rob was talking about, the qualities there, talking about character, um, in terms of the buildings and the layout and the landscape, um, how the roads, the parking, pedestrianisation work, and how integrated they are with the, with the place, um, how context specific is the place, um, and do, do, do they allow for things like adaptation and change over time that we talked about? Um, and how's the environment and community, how effective and successful do we think that is? This is an example, uh, this is in, again in, uh, in Gateshead, this is the stay, it's a housing development developed by Wayne Hemingway and, um, and a major house builder. Um, I, I think it's successful in some respects and not in other ones, uh, but it's an example of this actually got a Building for Life award uh, and they went through this process of looking at um, how fine is the grain, how much variety is there, there's different building heights there, different types of housing, sizes of housing. Uh, I'm not sure how quality the landscaping is, but there is some anyway. Um, and there are some courtyard spaces here developed for, for people living around them. Um, car parking doesn't dominate in this site, um, and there are even public, the public realm is quite high quality with seating and um, availability of, of different, different things, including barbecues and, and games and such like. So. Just to summarise then, Rob spent uh, the first session talking about what do these things mean. I've tried in, in my second half really talk about defining those two. The, it, if you can take away one thing from today, what I'd really like to take away is the idea that there's a relationship between these different aspects which need to be considered and are particular to each development. Um, and that when considering new development or changes or regeneration or any of these things, we should try and address many of the different interactions which happen here um, over time.